So good evening once again. So we'll start our session on NEET and INICT SS, a quick revision program on biostatistics and epidemiology. See, I, I, I've always get a lot of questions from SS candidates, like, Madam, can you just tell me this answer from PSM question? Madam, this is a question from community mercy. Can you just answer this question? Then you send me questions from biostatistics. But when I have gone through all these questions, what I have realized is none of these questions are uh, from PSM actually. All these questions that come for your SS entrance exam are actually related to medical research, which you as PGs have already gone through. So you are exposed to medical research and in your exam, you're just trying to recollect the things that you have learned or that you were supposed to learn during your PG time. So this is all about what you have done during your PG time as part of your thesis and dissertation. Okay, so I have some very important topics which I have uh, I have shortlisted for today's session, and all these sessions are based on the previous MCQs that you have got from your for your exam. And uh, I have got a lot of inputs from PG aspirants as well, based on which we have prepared this two-hour session. So shall we start? Let's start with the most important topic, which is coming almost every year for your exam, that is validity measures in screening and diagnostic tests. So validity measures. See, this is a very, very important topic. Out of all the topics that I have seen, this is the most important topic. And Moreover, this is a topic which is very close to our clinical practice because every day sitting in OP, you prescribe a lot of screening and diagnostic tests to your patients, right? Starting right from FBS, RBS up till CT, MRA, you prescribe a lot of screening and diagnostic tests to your patients, right? So while doing that, what is your intention at the back of your mind? My question is, I think uh, you can unmute and uh, whenever you feel like you can answer. Are you able to unmute? Can you just check? Okay, let me just check the visible. Oh, you're unable to mute, uh, unmute. Then how come we're I got... To, we're, we're able to unmute. You can unmute. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> you are able to unmute, I think. Anyway, so your intention is that, see, when you are advising your patient to do one particular screening test or diagnostic test, your intention is that this test should correctly diagnose all those who have the disease, right? At the same time, this test should be correctly able to rule out all those who do not have the disease, right? And how good is your screening or diagnostic test in picking the disease among the patients is actually measured using certain parameters like sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value, which is the parameters or which are the parameters that we are going to learn now and how to calculate them. Okay, so let's start with a very, very simple example. I'm going to take the simplest example, Mando test. Okay, so I'm unable to write. Mm. Okay, Mando test. Mando test is for TB, right? So imagine that I have 100. Oh. Imagine that I have taken 100 TB patients. I've taken 100. I'm unable to use this gadget properly. So I may take five minutes for me to get accustomed to this. So please excuse me. Mm, yeah, it's all right now. So imagine that I have 100 TB patients with me and 100 normal people. Normal in the sense they don't have TB. I've diagnosed these 100 to be having TB by a gold standard test, say a uh, nucleic acid amplification test. And I have ruled out TB from these 100 with the same test. Now I'm going to apply Mando to see how good is Mando in detecting TB. Okay, 
Now I have a question. See, first, I'm going to apply Mando to all these 100 TB patients. My question is, will all of them correctly give me positive Mando? They all have TB. My question is, will all of them correctly give me positive Mando? What do you think? Yes or no? Those who can unmute can tell me. See, guys, they all have TB. Will all of them correctly give me Mando test? No, you are right. Absolutely. See, instead of intradermal, if I'm pricking subcutaneously, I'll be getting negative. If one of the patient is immunocompromised, I'll be getting a negative result. If I'm not taking important drug, again, I'll be getting negative result. That means due to various reasons, a few number of TB patients can give me negative Mando result. Next, I'm going to apply Mando to these 100 normal people without TB. Again, the same question. Will all of them correctly give me negative Mando? Again, the answer is no. Right? Due to various reasons, a few number of normal people can give me positive Mando. Right? Are you with me? Now, let's suppose that when I apply Mando to these 100 TB patients, out of these 100 TB patients, say 80 gave me positive Mando result. And out of this 100 normal people, say some 90 gave me negative Mando result. Okay. Now, I want to tell you something. I hope you already know that for your exam, you will be getting the question in the form of a statement. You will be getting something like this. That means you have this many number of disease, this many number of non disease and when you apply the particular test, this many were uh, found to be positive and this many were found to be negative. So you will be getting something like this only for your exam. And you will be asked to find out the validity measures. What are the what is sensitivity? What is specificity? What is positive predictive value? And what is negative predictive value? Okay. So the first thing that you have to keep in the mind is the question will always be in the form of a statement. And the first thing that you have to do is to construct a two into two table. Okay. I hope you guys are already familiar with what a two into two table is. Okay. It is known as two into two or two into two or two by two table is the first thing that you have to draw. It is not as two into two because it has got two columns and two rows like this. Okay, so you construct something like this first. Then you have to correctly enter the numbers in each of this set. For that, the first thing that you have to do is you have to correctly mark the disease status and the test status. Okay, so where will you mark disease and where will you mark the test result it's actually very very simple see never ever forget this small or simple dictate c d always keep this in your mind c d c means column d means disease just keep this in mind you will never ever go wrong okay same applies when you are calculating or spatial relative risk, which we will be seeing after a few minutes. Okay. So, along the column, always mark disease. That is the dictate. So, this is column, right? This is column. And row is towards the right or, you know, the horizontal one. So, here you write the disease status and here you write the test status. Disease positives, negatives. Test positives, negatives. Like this. Okay. Once this is done, then it is easy to put all the numbers inside the set. I'll show you. See, this is how you construct the two to two table. Like I told you, C, D applies everywhere. Okay. And now I'm going to substitute the values. I'm going to put the values as per our discussion. I have 100 TB patients, right? Here, the disease is TB and the test is matter, which I have substituted here. So I have 100 TB patients, 100 normal people. And when I applied Manzo, out of this 100, I said 90, no, I said 80 correctly gave me positive Mando result, right? So I can write 80 here. And out of these 100 normal, 90 gave me negative Mando result correctly. So where am I go going to put that 90? Here. Okay, so simple. This much you will definitely get from the question. Now, can't you fill the rest? So simple. So 20 here, 
10 here. Okay. And 90 here, 110 here. Okay. Pura. Okay. Now, next. These are my true positives. Right? These are my true negatives. No doubt about it. Now, what about these 10? Everyone knows that this 10 and 20 are false. But at least one or two or three attending this might be having a doubt whether this 10, is it false positive or false negative? By the way, can someone let me know what is whether it is false positive or false negative? I'm asking about this 10. False positive. Very good. It is false positive. See, I'll tell you why it is known as false positive. See, here you are trying to find out how good is your test in detecting the disease, right? So the importance is always given to the test result and these cells will be named according to the test result. Now look at this. Here, test call these 10 as positives. So they will be any day branded as positives only. But they do not have the disease, so it is false. Okay. Whereas, what about this 20? Test call them as negative. So they will be branded as negatives only. But it is false. So this is false negative. So this is also something that you need to know. Because I've seen questions like gold standard. According to the gold standard, Mr. X is having, is having the disease. Whereas the, the screening test found him as negative. So is it true positives, false positives, true negatives, false negatives? So to answer that question, you should have this concept in the mind. How to, how these cells are named. And it's very, very simple. Always the cells are named according to the test result. Okay. Now, moving on to the most important thing. How to calculate sensitivity, specificity, positivity value and negativity value. We'll start with the first one, sensitivity. I want your listening, your complete listening for the next Two to three minutes or maximum five minutes. What is sensitivity? Sensitivity means listen carefully. Ability of your test to detect all those who have the disease from the diseased population is sensitivity. So when you calculate sensitivity in the denominator, you put all those who have the disease. Among them, how many were actually picked to be having the disease by your test is sensitivity. Okay, then what is specificity? Ability of your test to detect all those who do not have the disease from the non-diseased population. So while calculating specificity, remember, always, always put the non-diseased in the denominator. Out of them, how many were correctly picked to be not having the disease by your test is specificity. Okay, so you have sensitivity and specificity. Now there is one more property for screening and diagnostic test, which is predictive value. And as you all know, we have two types of predictive value. One is positive predictive value and the next is negative predictive value. What is it? So simple. As the name indicates, positive predictive value means as the name indicates, out of those who are predicted to be positive by the test, how many are actually positive? Okay, now look at this. Here, in this particular example, you know that 90 were predicted to be positive by the test, which actually includes true positives as well as false positives, right? Out of them, how many are actually having the disease? So, while calculating positive predictive value, as the name indicates in the denominator, you put all those who were predicted to be positive by the test. Okay, this one. Out of them, how many are actual positives? Now, you will be able to tell me what is negative predictive value. Out of those who were predicted to be negative by the test, how many are actual negatives? Okay, that is your positive predictive value, negative predictive value. Okay, yeah, finished. Okay, so that is sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value. Now, can someone tell me what is uh, using these numbers here? Someone can volunteer and tell me what is uh, sensitivity here. Just the numbers, denominator and numerator. Sensitivity is? Come on, guys, please. 90 by 100. Sensitivity. Uh, Sensitivity. I'm asking about the first one. What is going on? Ah, yeah. Right, right, right. Very good. Specificity. So, sensitivity is, I'm sure you will answer correctly. 
Okay. Sensitivity is 80 divided by 100 into 100. So we'll get it as 80 percentage. That means this test can detect only 80 percentage of those having disease. Specificity would be 90 divided by 100. So 90 percentage. Positive predictive value. Okay, I want to know positive predictive value. That is the one that usually, that is where you, okay, PPV, 80 divided by 19. NPV, NPV, okay, NPV is correct, 90 divided by 110. So I've got a lot of correct answer. I'm very happy. So positive predictive value is 80 divided by 90 into 100. And negative predictive value, as you have rightly said, it is 90, uh -uh. Yeah. 90 divided by 110 into 100. That's it. Okay, so that finishes the whole of validity parameters actually. Okay, as simple as that. So, that is your sensitivity, specificity, possibility, value, and negativity value. In terms of A, B, C, D, that is also a question that you can expect. As you all know, this is A, this is always your B, this is always your C, this is always your D. Okay, just think about A, B, C, D. What would be sensitivity? A divided by A plus C, right? I think I don't have to write sensitivity is A divided by A plus C. Or else we'll go to the previous one. Here we have already written. So, A, B, C, D. So, sensitivity would be A divided by A plus C. Specificity would be D divided by B plus D. Positive predictive value would be A divided by A plus B. Negative predictive value would be D divided by C plus D over that finishes. Okay. So all these we have discussed, each of this is an MCQ, which you can expect. I've seen in many question papers. So huh, one more thing I want to tell you. Positive predictive value, I've told you what is positive predictive value. You know what is sensitivity, what is specificity, ability of the test to detect those who are having disease, those who do not have the disease. Now, positive predictive value and negative predictive value, the calculation is very clear to you. Now, I want to tell you one more thing. Positive predictive value by definition means probability that a person with a positive result for actually having disease. I repeat, probability, what is the probability that a person who is coming to your OP with a positive result will be actually having the disease? For example, if I say that positive predictive value of, uh, simply positive predictive value of which one can I say, RT-PCR for COVID. Uh, if I'm saying that positive predictive value is only 90 percentage, that means if a person is coming to you, to your OP with a COVID positive result, or RT-PCR, that means he has only 90% or he has a 90% chance for actually having the disease or the other way around. Even though he's found to be positive, there is a 10% chance that he will not be having the disease. So you should always consider, ideally, I'm saying ideally, we should always consider the positive predictive value and negative predictive value while interpreting the result. Okay, so that is the application of positive predictive value and negative predictive value. Okay, so we have gone through the theory part and the MCQs going to the problem-based question. This is a previous MCQ. A physical examination was used to screen for breast cancer in 2,500 women with biopsy-proven adenocarcinoma of breast and in 5,800 race match control women. The result of physical examination were positive in 1,000 cases and 800 controlled women. Find out the sensitivity and positivity value of physical examination. Can you just try doing it? It won't take much time. I hope you're sitting with pen, pencil and such things. Yeah. So here comes the answer. Aravind Selvaraj. Okay, so one person has given the answer. That means you have got time to do it. So shall we move on to the 
discussion part. By the way, which is the disease here? So simple. I know you guys will definitely do given time, but I can't give you time. That is a problem. So here are the diseases. I don't know carcinoma. Let me see a breast. Huh? So you have clearly given. Uh, you have two thousand five hundred women with CA breast and five thousand. Control service without CA breast. And which is the screening test here? Physical examination. Okay, that means self breast examination or some physical examination. And out of 2,500 women, when they did a physical examination, 1,000 were found to be positive. And out of this 5,000, physical examination found 800 to be positive. So this much you will definitely get from the, from the question itself, right? Now, can't you write the rest? Of course, very simple. 1000 minus 2500, you will get us 1500 here, and 5000 minus 800, you will get 4200 here. Now, you can find out anything sensitivity, specificity, positivity value, negativity value, right? Sensitivity would be 1000 divided by 1200. Specificity would be 1000 divided by 1800. Positive priority value would be 1000 divided by 1800. And negative, oh, did I say something wrong? Sensitivity would be 1000 divided by 2500. Specificity, 4200 divided by 5000. Okay. Positive predictive value would be 1000 divided by 1800. And negative predictive value would be 4200 divided by 5700. So the answer is A. Okay. I hope you guys have followed. Yeah. Okay, Isha, thank you. So, shall I move on to the next? Okay, 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 Jovin, Krishna, Bhushan. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, so let's move on to the next. This is the first type. There are actually two types of questions that we normally get from this topic. So, the ideal or 90% of questions would be like this only. And I've seen one more type of question, which is going to be like this. Again, it's very simple, but a slightly different type apart from what we have seen till now. Now look at this. A diagnostic test for a particular disease has a sensitivity of 0.9 and specificity of 0.9. A single test is applied to each subject in the population in which the disease population is 10% age. What is the probability that a person who is positive to this test has the disease? By the way, what are you asked to find out? Which parameter they have asked to find out. Those who can unmute can tell. Yeah, exactly. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. So the question is to find out positive predictive value. So here in the question, they have given sensitivity of the test, specificity of the test, and prevalence of the disease in the population. And you're asked to find out positive predictive value. Then how to find it. Here, definitely, you will be asked to find either positive priority value or negative priority value given sensitivity and specificity. And how to address such a question? Very simple. Just look at the prevalence. Prevalence is 10 percentage. What does that mean? That means if you take, take 100, how many will be having disease? 10 will be having disease. How many will not be having disease? 90 will not be having the disease. Right? like this. Okay. Right? That means prevalence is 10. So if you take 100, 10 are diseased, 90 are not diseased. Now sensitivity and specificity are 90 percentage each. Very clearly given. That means when you apply this test, 90 percentage of this 10 will be true positives and 90 percentage of this 90 will be true negatives. Right? So 90 percentage of 10, 90% of 90, 81. So, what to write in the rest of the cells? So simple. You write 9 here, 10 minus 9, 1 here. Now, by merely looking at it, you know, positive predictive value is 50 percentage. Is it not? So, 9 divided by 80, positive predictive value is 50 percentage. Okay. Is it clear? Just give me some feedback. Yeah, 50 percentage. Yeah, yeah, here comes 50 percentage. Debaru. Yeah, Babita. Okay, okay. So everybody got it right. So happy. That's it. I don't have anything more to say. 
from this. Okay, so that finishes the quick revision in validity parameters. So shall we go on to the next? I hope you guys are with me here, up till here. So let's go on to the second topic, which is study design. Now you would be wondering why you still get questions from study designs, because it is again related to research. And as PGs, you have already gone through this while doing research thesis and your, that means your PG thesis and dissertation. So you are already exposed to what is a study design, how to go about when you have case control, how to go about when you have cohort, and they are trying to see how much you have learned during your PG time. Okay, and from study designs, there are actually three types of questions. First one, you will be given a situation and the question will be to find out which is the study design, whether it is coming under case control or cohort or RCT or something else. Second, you will, it is, the second will be a problem-based question, okay, where you will be asked to find out sometimes odds ratio, relative risk and things like that. Third is, for each study design, there is a guideline when you are reporting it. That is the third thing that we are going to see. So let's start with the most important study designs that you have gone through while doing your PG thesis, which are none other than the most important three, section study, case control, and cohort. So if you go one year back, you will realize that all of means almost 99 percentage of aspirants who are attending this class would have gone through one of this rct usually we don't do in uh, your pg thesis so almost 99.99 percentage would have gone through one of these study design so i'm not going to teach you anything new is what i'm telling you okay it's all old things huh? earlier you have learned all this so first question See, all these are coming under observational. These are observational study designs. Observation means you're just observing and you are doing the study. That means you're not intervening. Once you intervene, that becomes experimental. So under that is coming RCT, your randomized control trial. Whereas all these are observational study designs. That means something is happening and you're just observing and you're doing the study. Yes. Okay. So observational study designs. Cross-sectional study, we'll start with the first one, cross-sectional. It's a very simple, okay, one or two things only for your MCQ. Cross-sectional means a one-time examination of the population. The best example is doing a survey. Best example is doing a survey. So survey is an example for cross-sectional population, cross-sectional study design, doing a survey, okay? And when you do a survey or when you do a cross-sectional study, what is the outcome measure that you're getting? You're getting prevalence. Okay, what you get as the outcome is prevalence. So survey is the example and prevalence is the outcome. Okay, now what do you mean by prevalence? Prevalence will tell you the disease burden in that population. For example, uh, I want to know the prevalence of, say, COVID-19 in a village having 10,000 people. Huh? Okay, there are 10,000 people and I want to know the prevalence of COVID-19. So I have surveyed, I have gone to, I have surveyed all these thousand and I found that in, so the so survey was done in uh, say December 2021. So I want to know the prevalence of COVID-19 in this village having 10,000 population for COVID-19 in the month of December 2021. So I found that out of 10,000, say 200 were found to be having COVID at that point or in December. And you have to multiply that with 1,000. So that will tell you per 1,000 people in that village, what was the prevalence of COVID-19? So you'll get it as how much? You'll get it as 20 per 1,000, right? So 20 per 1,000 was the prevalence or Two percentage was the prevalence. Okay, so this is what you get from a cross-sectional study. That's it. Okay, moving on to the next two. 
taste control and alcohol these can be dealt together because they are coming under a particular type of study design known as analytical study design both are coming under analytical study design because here you are analyzing the risk factors they are coming under analytical study design each and everything that i am telling is an mcq okay and i am really speaking about mcqs here analytical study design then what about cross sectional it is descriptive study design this is descriptive whereas case control and cohort are coming under analytical study design and in analytical study design you you will always always have an exposure and an outcome okay and you want to know whether this exposure is a risk factor or a protective factor for this particular outcome that is what you are trying to see in analytical study design okay and how do you find out whether it is a risk factor or a protective factor for that you have to find out the risk measure and the risk measure in case control is odds ratio and the risk measure in a cohort is relative risk is relative risk okay now the problem is it's not a problem something that you may come across little bit confusing is you will be given a question and you will be asked to find out which is the which is the risk measure so first thing you have to identify whether this is a case control or cohort for that just see how this study is being done very simple please listen in case control as the name indicates you are studying cases and controls that means you start with by the way what is case case means a group of patients right a group having a particular see every day you know p and i p you are seeing patient cases right there was a case case means you are talking about a disease okay a rare case means a rare disease so case means a disease or a disease condition so cases means a group of patients having one particular disease and you take controls a group without that particular disease then you are retrospectively assessing their exposure status okay you are asking them about their exposure status whereas in cohort you are starting with the exposure you are following them into the future to see the outcome okay so that is the difference between case control and cohort so in both case control and cohort you will have an exposure and outcome whereas the direction from where you start the study would be different are you with me till here now i'll give you one example so that will that, that will help you to understand it better a very very simple example or classical example that we always take for case control cohort smoking and lung cancer okay so how to do it as according to case control as i told you case control nothing to mark up as the name indicates case control always start with cases and controls that is why you call it as case control right so you take a group of lung cancer patients hmm? suppose i have 100 lung cancer 100 is the it's a it's always a good number to give example huh? so i have 100 lung cancer ca lung patients and i have 100 normal normal in the sense they don't have ca lung and then what i do is i'll go to this case group and i'll ask each and every person in case a question are you a smoker or have you ever smoked same question i last to each and every person in my control groups that means i will take their history regarding their exposure to smoking then i will find out the proportion of smokers in my cases and the proportion of smokers in my controls and this difference in the proportion of exposure is what you use for calculating odds ratio okay whereas in cohort you are going the opposite in the opposite direction so this is a retrospective thing that means you are you are going back uh, into the history whereas cohort is just the opposite okay by the way what do you mean by cohort i told you case control is known as case control because you start with cases and control whereas cohort is known as cohort because you are starting your study with cohorts so that brings you to the next question what is cohort actually cohort word meaning is is actually this name has derived from a group of soldiers okay so as you can see they look very common right 
So a group having common something is cohort. So here, a group having common exposure is cohort. So you are starting with a group of smokers. Then you have a group of non-smokers. So I have 100 smokers, 100 non-smokers. And prospectively following them into future for, say, 10 years or 20 years. And at the end of 10 years or 20 years, I'm seeing what percentage of my smokers have developed lung cancer and what percentage of my non-smokers have developed lung cancer and this difference in the percentage of outcome is what you compare in cohort to find out relative risk. Okay, so it's very, very simple. What I want to tell you is just look at the question and see from where exactly are you starting the study. Are you starting the study with the cases and controls and going back or are you starting the study with the exposure and going forward? So that will help you to know whether it is a case control or cohort and both are analytical strategies and you will always see one exposure and one outcome for sure. Okay. Now let's see whether you have understood. So this is also a previous question. Very simple question. I want the answer. So this is the first type of question that you can expect. Identify the study design. 20 pregnant women were asked about their history of smoking when they came for regular antiretal visit and then followed up to see how sure. many of them had. Yeah, very, very simple. What? What is the answer here? Cohort. Yeah, and she, correct. It's cohort. I know nobody would disagree. It is cohort only. Everybody will say cohort. Let me just check the chat box. Ah, uh, yeah, hundred percentage. Yeah, Abdullah, everyone. Yeah, Sravya, Naresh, you're right. It's cohort. Now I'm going to give you the next question. Now it seems like very simple. A study was done in three states to see the mean blood pressure in each community. Health workers were assigned and they visited each house in three communities. Mean blood pressure in each community was found and compared. It's a study design. Is going to talk. What is the study design? Are you answering? Yeah, cross sectional. Yeah. Very good, very good. It's a survey, right? It's a survey. Okay, 100 percentage. Correct answer. Uh, why isn't it a field trial? No, no. Trial is something different. I'll come to it. Okay, trial means you are intervening. There's no intervention here. Okay, okay. just a yeah. survey. So they are just going in three nearby villages to find out the percentage of uh, not smokers. What was it? Oh, yeah, percentage of uh, or mean blood pressure to find out the mean blood pressure. That's it. So it's just a survey. Okay. Ah, next question. In a hospital, mm -hmm. DVD patients were taken and they were compared with other patients to find out the risk factors. So case control. Exactly. No one has got it right. Oh, sorry, no one has got it wrong. Everyone has got it right. So that finishes identifying the study design. Now let's see how to calculate the risk measure. Even more easy. See, the risk measure, sometimes you, you see the risk measure is also known by another name, which you have learned during your UG time or during your entrance, heat entrance exam for your PG strength of association. So the question may not be like find out the risk measure or find out odds ratio, find out relative risk. It, can, it could also be like find out the strength of association. So if they're asking you to find out the strength of association, keep in your mind the question is regarding finding out either odds ratio or the relative risk because that number will give you how much is the strength of association between this exposure and the outcome. That is why it is not a strength of association because that number will tell you the strength. Okay. Now, let's see what is the strength of association or what is the risk measure in case control. Obviously, everyone knows what is a case control risk measure, which is nothing but odds ratio, right? So, what is odds ratio actually? But what do you mean by odds? We always use this term odds. What does the odds of getting a head when you toss a coin? What is the odds of getting six when you toss a die? So what is odds? Exactly, probability or chance, right? So 
in odds ratio, I'm not going into the details, just understand that as an AMD case here, you are actually calculating the probability of exposure among your cases divided by probability of exposure among your controls. Okay, now let's see the example, one example. As I told you, I have 100 cases and 500 controls, right? This is the two to two table. Guys, like I told you earlier, here also you have to draw a two to two table. Otherwise, you may not get the answer correct. Hmm? So, I hope pen and paper would be given this time. Even without pen and paper, just construct a two to two table at least in your mind. Okay. So, we have, uh, see, again, CD. I mean, I told you, CD. Here also it is CD. Instead of test, here you have the exposure, smoking, present, absent. There it was, you know, manto, positive, negative. So CD applies everywhere. It holds true everywhere. Whenever there is a two to two table. So I have 100 uh, CA lung patients. I have 100 normal people. When I asked them about the smoking, I found that out of this 100, 60 gave a positive history for smoking. And uh, out of this 100, 20 gave a positive history for smoking. So I'm going to write like this. Hope it's fine. See, this is this much you will definitely get from the question. And then you have to fill the rest, which is very simple. 100 minus 40, 100 minus 60, you will get it as 40 here. And you will get 80 here like this. And when you add 80, 120. Okay. Hope you have followed it here. Now, this is your E. This is your B. This is C. This is D. Okay. Now, how to find out odds ratio? You know, odds ratio is also known as cross product ratio. It is also known as cross product ratio. Because when you take the cross, when you take a cross like this, the product is odds ratio. So, what is, what is that cross product? It is A, D by B, C. So, this is the odds ratio, AD by BC. Okay. Now, can you just find out the odds ratio here and let me know? In this particular example, what will be the odds ratio? AD by BC. Correct. Six. You will get six. So, odds ratio is six. You are right. Now comes the next part. How will you interpret? What do you mean by odds ratio of six? Odds ratio six means smokers have six times more chance for getting lung cancer than non-smokers. Okay. Odds ratio three means smokers have three times more chance for getting lung cancer compared to non-smokers. That is why I said that will give you the strength of association. That will give you the strength of association between this exposure and outcome. Okay. Or in short, the interpretation is very, very simple. Look at the odds ratio. If the odds ratio is more than one, that means the outcome is more among the exposed. That means it is a risk factor. This exposure is a risk factor. If odds ratio is less than one, that means this exposure is a protective factor. Like, uh, for example, vaccination. Okay. And COVID or vaccination and some other disease, any other disease, you will be getting odds ratio less than one. That means it is a protective factor. Then what about odds ratio equal to one? That means whether you are exposed or non-exposed, the outcome is the same in both the groups. That means no association. This is neither a protective factor nor a risk factor. Okay, means no association. These are also MCQs. Okay, no association. Are you with me till here? Have you understood? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. So this is how you interpret an odds ratio. Now let's see what is the risk measure in cohort. Actually, there are many outcome measures in cohort, like incidence, then relative risk. Out of all this, the risk measure is given by relative risk, also known as risk ratio, because I've seen questions in which find out the risk ratio is the question. So don't 
uh, I mean, don't get confused. What is risk ratio? That is another name for relative risk. See, at the end, if you have any doubt, just, you know, while I'm taking the class, if you have any doubt, just uh, write it down somewhere. And once I finish the class, we can, if time permits, we can go for a discussion. Okay. Like a doubt clearance session. Okay. So this is risk ratio. Now, how to find out relative risk? It's very simple. It is given by the formula, incidence of disease among the exposed divided by incidence of the disease among the non-exposed. Okay. By the way, what do you mean by incidence? It's a prospective study design, right? Where you're trying to find out new cases. So incidence is number of new cases among the exposed, number of new cases, which happen during your follow-up time among the exposed divided by number of new cases which happened in your non-exposed group during your follow-up time or at the end of your follow-up. Okay. Now, let's see one example to find out relative risk. Suppose I started with 100 smokers and 100 non-smokers and I followed them for 10 years and at the end of 10 years, again, same to do table, CD. Hmm? I won't tell it again. Hmm? So you have 100 smokers, 100 non-smokers. And I followed them for 10 years and I found that at the end of 10 years, 10 of my smokers developed lung cancer and two of my non-smokers developed lung cancer. Okay, this much will be given in the question. Hmm? This much data you will get from the question. And of course, here you can write 90 and 98. Right? Now, find out the relative risk or risk measure in a cohort study. Obviously, this is a cohort study. What is the incidence? Number of new cases. These are the new cases, right? So, number of new cases among your, your exposed divided by incidence among the non-exposed. You will get it as number of uh, incidence among your cases is 10 divided by 100. Right? The whole divided by Two divided by 100. Okay, since it is 100, it's easy. You will get it as 1. Right? Now, what do you mean by? So, you, you got relative risk as 5. Oh, same thing, same thing. Okay. You got relative risk as 5. Now, how are you going to interpret? Both are risk measurements, right? Both will give you strength of association, right? So, the interpretation is also the same. That means odds ratio and relative risk are both interpreted in the same way. Only difference is that odds ratio is your measure or that is, a, that is a risk measure that you get from case control, whereas relative risk you get from the cohort. That is the only difference. Okay. So if you're getting relative risk equal to five, that means smokers have five times more chance for developing lung cancer compared to non-smokers. Or in short, like I said earlier, relative risk more than one means it is a risk factor. Relative risk less than one means it is a protective factor. Relative risk equal to one means no association. No association. Okay. So that finishes the risk measures as well. Now, can you do this question? I'm not reading. You can read and you can do the question. And please let me know the answer once you have finished. I'll wait. Yeah, five. Sorry, I didn't see your answers. If I write. Do this now. Is it a case control or cohort? Okay, got one answer, two, three, four, five, so. It's a case control. Okay. What is number needed to treat? I'll come to it. Wait, wait, give me time. Let me finish one by one. You're right. This is a case control. So cases, race syndrome, and the exposure is ASA, right? 
acetyl salicylic acid. And from the question, it is clearly given 27 were having the disease and 140 were not having the disease, right? And when they took history, out of this 27, 26 were diseased and out of this 140, sorry, not disease, have, have had that exposure and out of 140, 53 had that exposure. And what about odds ratio here? Odds ratio equals, I'm, I'm very confident that you will do it. I'm not waiting for your answers. I think many have answered. I didn't check. Divided by 53. You'll get it as 42 point something. What is the answer? Correct. The answer is 42. Okay, so that part is over. One more from study designs. Try this. A new drug compared with an old one for side effects. Both drugs were given to 16,500 patients, 1,600 developed side effects in the new drug group, and side effects were found in 1,800 who had not taken the, who had taken the old drug, calculate the relative risk. So directly they have asked relative risk. Even otherwise, you will identify this as a cohort because it's a prospective study design. It could even be a RCT because I'm sure somebody will ask me, could it be an RCT? Could it be an intervention? Of course, this could be an intervention provided the researcher is the one who is allotting the drugs to the patient. Mm -hmm. If as a PG, you are simply observing the study, uh, you know, uh, a group of patients have taken a new drug. Mm -hmm. Your HOD has given a new drug to a group of patients and there is another group who is taking an old drug. And if you're simply observing the study, uh, then that becomes, I mean, some simply following them and seeing what is the outcome that becomes a cohort study. Anyway, this is a prospective study design. And what is the answer? Have you got the answer? Yes, you're right. Everybody's right. Aishwarya, Ashish, Priyanka. Good guys, good going. Okay, Poonam. Oh, I'm so happy. Everybody has got the answer correct. So I think I don't have to, okay, you have done it already. It's there in the question. So incidence among the of side effects. Here the outcome that we are looking for is side effects, not the cure rate. So side effect among the new drug users. So you've got the incidence, incidence among the side effect, uh, incidence of side effect among the old drug users, 0 0.109 and divide it, you'll get it as 0.88. You're right. Now, please, please listen. I'm just going one more step further regarding a question from a previous INICT question paper. Now, how are you going to interpret this? If it is a number more than one, obviously you will say, okay, this many, the risk is this many times more. Huh? Or the chance of getting the outcome is five times more or three times more that we have seen. What if, see, definitely this shows that it is a, Protective factor. Now, how are you going to interpret? How much protection is it giving? For that, you have to calculate something known as, this is relative risk, right? You have to calculate something known as relative risk reduction. Okay, that means what percentage of reduction is there in the outcome? And how do you find it? You got it as 0.88. So, 1 minus 0 0.88. That you into you have to convert that into percentage. So you'll get it as 11.1. .1. That means this new drug is giving 11.1 percentage protection compared to the old drug in the side effect. Or it is protecting or preventing or this much protection. 11.1 .1 percentage protection is given by the new drug compared to the old drug when it comes to side effects. Are you understanding? Okay. This is known as relative risk reduction. And this is how you interpret a Relative risk, which is less than one. That means protection. Protective factor means how much. And that how much is given by relative risk reduction, which is always given as percentage. Okay, I hope you have followed till here. Ma'am, two into two table. Uh, what happened? You didn't see the two into table? Wait, 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 wait. 
Yeah, this is a two hundred rupee table. This much they have given. Something wrong? What happened? I thought it's very simple because I already got the answer correct from many participants. So I thought um, without this two hundred rupee table, definitely you wouldn't have got the answer correct. Taura, kya hua? What happened? Any confusion? <laughs> okay, okay, got it now. Okay, so sh shall I move forward? Prevalence. How to calculate prevalence? Someone ask. Did anyone ask? I felt like I saw it. Jet pre. Okay. Arey, yar. Prevalence is very simple. See, per thousand people, how many are diseased? That's it. Okay. So, I'm just. I'll use the same. I'll just write it here. Hmm? Somewhere here. See, the example. You want the same example, or I'll take some other example. I want to know the prevalence of. Uh, prevalence of hypertension i want to know the prevalence of hypertension hmm? so in a population so i surveyed say again we'll take the same 10000 okay i surveyed 10000 people and i found that out of this 10000 there's no space to write that okay or else wait right here someone asked how to calculate prevalence Others would have understood, but just for one person, let me take one extra minute from you. So, a prevalence of hypertension. Mm -hmm. So, when I did a survey, so how many you surveyed in total? I had 10,000. So, out of this 10,000, how many were found to be positive? Say, this time it was, uh, it is 300. Okay, 300 were found to be positive. Okay, that means 300 per 10,000. So that is not a nice way of expre expressing, right? So we have, we want to say it, it would be better if you can express it as per 1,000, right? So multiply it with 1,000. So that becomes per 1,000. So per 1,000, how much will it come? 30 per 1,000, okay? So 30 per 1,000 is the prevalence of hypertension in this particular population, okay? Or you can even put it as percentage. Then it will become how much? It becomes three percentage. Okay, so that way you can do it. This is how you calculate prevalence, which you will get from when you do a survey. And survey is coming under not case control and cohort, it is coming under your cross section study. Okay. Shall I move forward? Okay. Where were we? Ah, relative risk reduction. So that finishes our study design. We have seen how to identify a study design. We have seen how to calculate the risk measures. Moving on to the last part. Uh, no, no, no. RCT is left. Huh? We haven't done uh, RCT. So one more is there. RCT. Actually, two more are there. RCT and a little bit about meta-analysis. I have also included. Now, in RCT, these are usually drug trials. Okay, these are usually drug trials. And as you can see in this picture, you take a group of patients, divide them into two arms of almost equal size. Now you actually call them as random assignment. I'm not going to those details. Those are not, not required. One arm is known as the treatment arm. The other arm is known as the control arm. To the treatment arm, you give your drug of choice. And to the control arm, you give either placebo or a standard treatment that you are following. Hmm? Drug of choice means your new drug. Hmm? And to this, Control group, you give a placebo or some other standard regimen that you are following in your ward. Then you follow them for, say, one month or two months to see what percentage got cured because of your new drug and what percentage got cured because of your placebo or the old drug. And this difference in the cure rate is what you are comparing as an outcome in relative risk. Okay. So here also you are, you can actually measure relative risk. That is fine. But that way, the question, I mean, you won't be asked to find out what is relative risk here. You can always find, but the type of question that you get would be something different from RCT. The outcome measures in RCT, there are mainly four, not four, there are mainly three terms or terminologies which you can expect. Okay. Okay, you have understood. Very good. Okay, 
So, where was I? Oh, yeah. Outcome measures in RCT. There are mainly three terminologies which always come for your exam in relation to RCT. So, just understand that these are terms that we always use with RCT as outcome measure. One is, I think you are familiar with these terms, intention to treat analysis. I'm not going to tell you what is intention to treat analysis. Just understand that. See, in RCT, what we do is we are actually, when you uh, you are actually giving the drug to the patients, you're sending them home, right? And you're asking them to come, for, come back for a follow-up. But what happens is when you really do this in the field, a few patients never ever come back. That happens, right? You already know. So the thing is, see, they are just lost to follow-up. They never come back. So the question is, what to do with these dropouts in the final result? That means during the final analysis, whether to include them or exclude them is a big problem. It's a confusion. And in RCT, the type of analysis that we do is intention to treat analysis where dropouts are included in the final analysis. Just keep in mind, this is intention to treat analysis. And unless specified otherwise, always, always do we do intention to treat analysis in an RCT where dropouts are included in the final analysis. Okay, and they are actually compared, considered as a group that did not get any benefit out of your treatment. That is why they went to a better doctor is our assumption. Anyway, dropouts are included in the analysis and they are considered as a group that did not get any benefit out of your treatment. Now, the opposite of this is not very important like your intention to treat analysis, but I'm just keeping it as a reserve for your exam. It is known as per protocol analysis, per protocol analysis where just the opposite dropouts are excluded in the final analysis but mostly we will be doing intention free analysis unless specified otherwise if the question is what is the how do you measure the outcome it is intention free analysis only okay if you are getting a question dropouts are excluded in the final analysis then which is the type of analysis then you write it is per protocol analysis Okay, so this is the first terminology that you have to keep in your mind with regard to the outcome measure in a RCT, randomized control trial. I never said randomized control trial. Assuming that you already are familiar with this term, randomized control trial is RCT. Okay, second term is efficacy of a drug. How to find out efficacy of a drug? Very simple. This is a formula. Rate of disease, that means outcome. Obviously, you are, you are seeing the outcome, right? Rate of disease among the placebo group, that means your control group, minus rate of disease in the treatment group divided by rate of disease in the placebo group into 100 is how you find the efficacy of the drug. Okay. Now, a little bit of maths. Huh? Not maths. I'm uh, not good in maths. Even otherwise, it's logic. I would say I will call all these as logic. I can cut, cut this one. And so this becomes one. And rate of disease among the treatment group. That means exposure group divided by outcome in the or rate of disease in the control or placebo group is nothing but relative risk, right? So that becomes, because this much is relative risk. Can you see? This is the formula for relative risk. So one minus relative risk is also a way to find out efficacy. So efficacy has got two formula. One is this and the second is this. So this formula also you should keep in your mind regarding how to find out the efficacy of a drug. Okay. And the third one is the question many have been asking me from the day I joined your, uh, your group. What is number needed to treat? It comes in an RCT. Okay, number needed to treat. See, if possible, you try to understand. Due to lack of time, I'm not going into the details. Please listen carefully. You'll definitely understand. Okay, so number needed to treat means, see, we have a treatment group and we have a control group, right? That means to one group you have, treatment group means to one group you have given your new drug. And to the second group, you have given your old drug. And when you followed up, a large number of patients got cured because of your new drug. And a few number of patients have got cured because of your old drug as well, right? See, the, to the control arm, you have given the 
old drug or i would say i can't say it as old drug you know though we always say placebo in reality you never give placebo to the control arm because it is unethical to deny treatment to a group of patients so what you give to the control arm is always always the standard regimen that you are following in your ward and you want to know whether the new drug is better than the best available one are you understanding because there is no point in bringing new new drugs what you want is a better drug than the best available so what i want to tell you is to the control arm you never give placebo instead you give the standard regimen that you are following in your ward and to the treatment group you give the new drug and you want to know whether the new drug is better than the one that is available so obviously at least a few number of patients will get cured because of your old drug but your assumption is that your drug is has got a much better cure compared to the drug you have in the control arm right right now the question is of course your drug is better but the question is what is the minimum number of patients that should be given your new drug for getting one extra cure compared to the old drug i repeat what is the minimum number of patients that what is the minimum number of patients that should be given your new drug for getting one extra cure for getting one extra cure compared to the old drug that is the definition for number needed to treat now we just read this minimum number of patients need to be treated to get an additional cure compared to the other drug okay that is number needed to treat now the question is how to calculate it is given by the formula 1 divided by incidence in the control group minus incidence in the treatment group okay the outcome in the control group divided by the outcome in the treatment group okay now i'm going to add one more thing which also you can keep as a reserve for your exam this formula you can always expect and i'm going to give you a reserve formula actually this denominator this is given by your name or this is also known as attributable risk reduction don't ask me what is it now just the name hmm? this denominator is known as attributable risk re reduction so that means incidence in control group minus incidence in treatment group is known as attributable risk reduction so another formula for number needed to treat is 1 divided by attributable risk reduction okay so this is how you calculate number needed to treat now the question is how to interpret hmm? what do you mean by this or how to interpret number needed to treat this means please listen carefully suppose i got number needed to treat as say Five. Hmm? I got number needed to treat as five. That means, if you give your old drug to five patients and you give your new drug to five patients, okay. Suppose out of let me take another color. Okay. Suppose when I gave my old drug to five patients and two got cured. that means i will get one extra cure compared to the old drug group that means if i give new to 5 then one extra matlab you will get 3 is it clear okay so less the number needed to treat better the drug is are you understanding because you will get one extra cure compared to the other drug this is what you mean by number needed to treat okay i hope you are with me have you understood This is actually a difficult concept. Even if you read, you won't understand. Okay, good, good. Darshan, Pranav. Okay. So this is number needed to treat, and this is how you calculate number needed to treat. And the opposite of this is number needed to harm. don't don't worry about number needed to half it's just the opposite opposite in the sense if the outcome that you are measuring is something like your side effect or you know sometimes sometimes death that means if it is a negative outcome that you are calculating then that becomes number needed to half that's it formula everything interpretation everything is the same okay compared to what is the minimum number that should be given this particular drug for getting one extra side effect that becomes number needed to half Now can you just do this? This is a question from number needed to treat. Just one question. 
Many have been asking, what is number needed to treat? As if there is nothing else in, in this particular topic. Do this and let me know the answer. Pure rate of two arms of uh, treatment in an hour. Ah, one more thing, let me tell you. When you, when you uh, do this, see, always try to uh, put these, substitute these values in proportion. That means if you are getting 10 percentage, put it as 0 0.01. Okay, don't put 10 as such. 0 0.02 instead of 20. So always put it as, first, I mean, put it as proportion. So point zero two point two. Okay, sorry, sorry. Point one and point point one and point. Let's see what answer are you getting. Have you got the answer? Ten, ten, ten. Okay, okay. You're right. Everybody got it right. Danish, Kamal, Arya, Farzana. Good, good. Huh. That means if you ankit, revo. Okay, okay. Now don't ever ask me what is number needed to trade. You have got the answer. It's so simple. That means what is the minimum number that should be given up? This particular treatment. See, you got something like this, right? And you got number needed to treat us 10. That means if you give this new drug to minimum 10 people, you will get one extra cure compared to the drug you have in the control of. And the last design is meta-analysis. I'm not going into much of the details of meta-analysis because that much is not needed. Uh, you will have to identify whether it is a meta-analysis or not. Now, what is meta-analysis? A word about meta-analysis. By the way, what do you mean by meta? Meta means after. Okay. Meta means after. So, as the name indicates, in meta-analysis, you are analyzing again and again and again what the studies which were done previously on the same topic. For example, Listen, uh, let's take one example. Suppose I want to do a meta-analysis to find out the risk factors of diabetes mellitus among Indian population using meta-analysis. Hmm? See, I know that I'm not the first person who's going to do this study. Many people have already done a lot of study in the same topic. So here what I do is I simply sit up here. Okay, and using internet and previous journals, I will collect all of those studies which were done on the same topic, I will collect those studies, I will compile their results, and I will come up with a new result. This is meta-analysis. So in meta-analysis, you will never collect data directly from the patients. Instead, you will be collecting data which were done previously by other researchers in the same topic. Okay, so systematically combining the results of previous research to arrive at a conclusion. And another thing that I, that I want to tell you is, in our evidence pyramid, okay, meta-analysis is occupying the topmost position. That means meta-analysis is the best study design, and this is known as gold standard study design. So gold standard study design is none other than meta-analysis. Because you might be thinking, see, sometimes you might be thinking this is like copying from others, but those who have ever copied know that it's not that easy to copy, right? It's an art. So, copying from other research and then compiling it is not an easy job. It's a difficult thing to do, and that is why it is known as gold standard design, study design. Gold standard study design, obviously. Hmm? Study design, which is meta analysis. So, this is meta analysis. Okay. Now, what about the outcome of meta analysis? I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to analyze nothing. Just a graph. You should be, suppose you're getting a, suppose you get an image like this, you should be able to identify this. I won't explain what it is because we don't have time. Is the time now? No, we don't have time. So this is a meta-analysis compiling the odds ratio. Okay. This graph is known as, can anyone tell me what you call the outcome measure? Is meta-analysis more accurate than RCT? Yes, Saravind. Yes. Very good. This is forest plot. Okay, guys. This is forest plot. So, 
forest plot is the outer measure in a meta analysis okay and someone was asking me what is the difference between meta analysis and systematic review do you really want that see just understand that both are somewhat the same only you are collecting data from previous research in systematic analysis you are not doing or i would say in meta analysis after collecting the data you are using a statistical software for combining this that means you are doing a statistical analysis that is why you call it as meta analysis actually i had no intention to go into these details but since you asked i just can't leave it huh? so in meta analysis at the end you are doing some statistical analysis using a software there is a software known as a reef software so you can just put all these data raw data from various research and you can finally do a statistical analysis whereas in systematic analysis you are just you are collecting and you are saying that of a 50% study set like this 20% study set like this you are just describing that means you are not doing a statistical analysis whereas in, in meta analysis you are doing a analysis as well using some statistical method so that is the difference between meta analysis and uh systematic reviews okay okay good coming to the last part from study design guidelines for reporting medical research i heard that this was last need assess question did you follow till here give me a feedback yes absolutely kaplan mera i'm coming to it give me some time okay 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 good so going on to the next part guidelines for reporting medical research we'll just see few names first is prisma prisma what is prisma full form is see you know what it is right when you are uh, see you might have gone through journal clubs and all during your pg time so definitely you might have come across these guidelines see if it is a cohort study there is a guideline regarding how to report it when you are writing the result how to report there is a guideline i'm not going into those details because that much you know in depth knowledge is not needed just the name and whether it is for meta analysis or for systematic review or for cohort that is all you require so just understand that this is see for every study design we have a guideline regarding how you as a researcher should be reporting it you just can't report like the way you want no there is a guideline everything should follow a guideline so prisma is the guideline for reporting full form is preferred reporting item for systematic review and meta analysis so naturally it is for systematic reviews and meta analysis easy to remember guys s m a if you see m a at the end it has to be meta analysis right and meta analysis are always accompanied with systematic review so this is the guideline for systematic review and meta analysis now i'll show you the next one this is actually a new guideline they have introduced not very new but i would say relatively new quorum quorum means quality of reporting of meta analysis so we have two one is prisma and quorum for meta analysis so you find m here you find m here at the end that means if you see m at the end it is meta analysis okay going on to so meta analysis is important going on to next consort consolidated standard of reporting trial so rt means obviously it is for rct easy Uh, nothing to mug up. The, it will be there in that name itself. RCT. This is for RCT. Strong strengthening of reporting of observational studies in epidemiology. So, if you see O B means observational, right? Again, very simple. And which are the observational study designs we have seen? Cross-sectional case control and cohort. So, strong is for cross-sectional case control and cohort. and last is start what is if you see d means diagnostic study so the last letter here is d so it is for diagnostic studies that means standard for reporting of diagnostic accuracy study so it is for diagnostic test evaluation by the way what is diagnostic test evaluation 
you have a new drug, sorry, you have a new test, diagnostic test or screening test, and you are comparing it with the gold standard, which is nothing but the one, the first topic that we have learned, sensitivity, specificity, positive value, negative value. So that will tell you, compared to the gold standard, how good is your new screening or diagnostic test. So diagnostic test evaluation is done by using sensitivity, specificity, positive value, negative value only. And for evaluating that, you have the start. So just look at the last, last letter you have. So that will tell you which is the study design. Okay, it's again so simple. So we have Prisma, Quorum, Consort, Straub, Starred. These are the only ones that you need to know. Just let me see. <laughs> okay, if time, if time permits, I'll come to evidence based. My God, I love to discuss all this, but what to do? We don't have that much time. That's why I said I'll be always available even after the class. Okay. Okay. So these are the ones that you should be known. And if you're interested, or you can keep it as a reserve. Huh? Seven. First oh. Sorry. Now close okay. the slide and we share it now. Oh, okay. Or I think it started. Oh, I have to close it again. Is it visible now? Can you just let me know whether you can see it now? No? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. That was actually... Um, okay. You can take it as a recap. Okay. Anyway, you are sitting and watching. So just take it as a recap. So it was not done intentionally, unintentional recap. Uh -huh. Okay, 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 all these we have done. Fast, 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 fast. RCT. Huh. This is a slide that I want to tell you to keep as a reserve. These are few newer names that have that have emerged. Not very new, but a little bit new. Okay. You have moves. Even if you don't learn it, it's fine. But just keep in your mind and you should be familiar with this name. Okay. Moves means meta-analysis of observational studies in epidemiology. That means if you're doing meta-analysis of observational study, you call it as moves. Okay. That is a guideline for reporting. Observational studies, meta-analysis. Then you have something else. Spirit. Spirit means standard protocol for recommended for interventionist trials. That means when you are planning to do a trial in future, then you know you need to see. I hope you all know that before doing any any study, you have to give protocol to the research committee, right? So they'll go through your protocol. So spirit is a protocol that is the protocol using which you should write the or that is the guideline using which you should write the protocol for a research trial and Spriga is strengthening of reporting of this G is nothing but genetic studies so for genetic studies we have Spriga so since these are new I thought I'll give that also as one slide okay but other things are very very important because you already got a question last year that was regarding STAR now coming to topic 3 errors type 1 and type 2 error Hope you have followed till here. Shall I move on to the next topic? Okay, okay. I hope you are following. 
next topic is errors type 1 and type 2 errors what are they see usually type 1 and type 2 errors are explained best based on drug trial just listen no need to write anything just listen because when you listen you will understand it hmm? listen carefully we have already seen that before bringing any drug into market it is mandatory that it has to undergo a drug trial and it has to prove that it is better the new drug is better than the one that is already existing right suppose i have developed a new molecule imagine that i have developed, developed a new molecule and i am subjecting my new molecule to a drug trial in reality there can be two possibilities i'm saying in reality there can be two possibilities first one my drug is actually better than the one that is existing second my drug is not as good as the one that is existing right after the trial trial can also give two results right one my drug is good second my drug is not as good as the one that is existing right right now i'm going to put or depict what i said in the form of a 2 into 2 table just have a look at this this is what i said this is the real state of affairs that means my drug is could be effective sometimes not effective the trial can also give two results mine is effective mine is not effective okay i'm just going step by step making sure that you are understanding every bit okay see am i audible i'm not getting any chat so i'm just wondering whether i am still audible and visible one of the participants can please let me know audible visible okay uh, in between i felt that there is some problem in the connection okay 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 all good all good okay so this is what i have said here i have depicted what i have said in the form of a two to two table now to continue suppose in reality my drug is good and the trial also said minus good then no problem we are happy because it is true it is true positive right suppose my drug is not good and trial also said the same thing that my drug is not effective again we are happy because that is true negative and correct result right now the problem comes here and here here what is happening actually my drug was not good but the trial gave a false positive result saying that my drug was good okay and here what is the problem actually my drug was good but the trial could not bring evidence to prove that my drug is better giving a false negative result are you with me till here okay submitting a false positive result is known as type 1 error and committing a false negative result is known as type 2 error okay each and everything that i see is an mcq okay i'm only trying to give you the mcqs type 1 error is known as alpha error or alpha i would write alpha as it's alpha error and type 2 error is known as beta it means like this beta error these are also mcqs okay so type 1 or false positive is alpha error and type 2 or false negative is known as beta error okay i hope you are following because this is a concept which is very important very difficult to understand and even more difficult to make you understand that is why i am stopping at every step and making sure that you are understanding it till then have you understood till here okay darshan eja okay 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 then i am going to ask you one question see both are errors that means both are not good but when you compare alpha error and beta error or when you compare type 1 and type 2 error which one do you think is more problematic is it type 1 or type 2 just let me know your your opinion both are errors both are not good i agree alpha. but which is more grievous alpha hmm 
alpha error it's not effective uh, then to putting in the market so of course okay okay so majority are saying oh, type 1 type 2 type 3 type 2 false negative okay see i'm getting a 50 50 opinion okay see, just imagine that the uh, new drug that i have developed is a say is a chemotherapeutic agent for ca call it hmm? and there is only one working drug in the market on which all patients with ca call it are surviving if i commit a type 1 error what will happen my inferior drug will replace the only one working drug in the market right right if i commit a type 2 error what will happen what will happen nothing will happen right the only one drug or working drug which is there in the market will continue to be in the market but there the error is that i couldn't help my patients with the better drug which i was having in my hand right so the error in type 2 is you are unable to help your patients with the better drug but at least i am not harming them right whereas in type 1 drug you are killing your patients with a inferior drug right are you following so in type 1 error you are doing harm to the patient in type 2 error the error is that you are unable to help the patient so which one do you think is more grievous or harmful or problematic alpha yeah exactly it is alpha so those who have said beta i hope it is clear to you just give me a thumbs up or a heart or something to show that you have understood okay 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 hope you are convinced why type 1 is more grievous okay okay good thank you moving still further see both are errors i said both are not good but the problem is whenever you do do a trial after all we human beings are the ones doing the trial mostly we doctors right so it is never ever you are you know it's never possible to completely eliminate either type 1 or type 2 error that means little bit of type 1 and type 2 error will definitely creep in in any studies that you do so what you can do to the maximum is elimination is not possible so what you do to the maximum is you will, say, you will put a cut off and you will say okay up till this much type 1 error is allowable or permissible i'm not saying that i want it but if at all it is happening up till this much is okay huh? if it goes beyond this cut off i'm not going to accept the result that i'm getting from my study or from my trial okay so the next mcq is what is that cut off for type 1 and type 2 the cut off for type 1 is 5 percentage that means a maximum allowable type 1 error in your study is 5 percentage okay type 2 since it's not that much problematic compared to type 1 up to a maximum of 20 percentage is okay okay 10 to 20 percentage is the allowable beta error okay is it clear okay i got the answer already oh i'm so happy that many already knew this answer good good okay ankit so these are also mcqs i don't want to write mcq every time but everything is an mcq okay so 5 percentage this 5 percentage is nothing but see uh, i'm just thinking whether to bring all that here what is p value what is that golden number for p value less than you have done thesis i've seen students coming to our community medicine department asking for p value madam can you just make a p value is it possible to get a p value less than dash ha <laughs> okay okay so i'm getting the answer 0.05 ha huh? p value 0.05 actually i had no intention to say it here but i'm just trying to relate both okay see p value 0.05 means in terms of percentage it is 5 percentage right so p value is nothing but that will tell you see p value is something that you are calculating after you get the result right so p value is nothing but that will tell you how much alpha error we have committed in your study is it clear so 5 percentage alpha is nothing but the p value less than 0.05 if you are getting a p value less than 0.05 0.05 that means the alpha error that you have committed is less than Five percentage, so you can easily access the study. That is why everybody is running behind getting a p value of less than zero point zero five, significant p value. Okay. 
one more MCQ. Now, don't ask me what it is. I'm not going to tell you what it is because that much details is not needed. Power of a test is given by one minus theta. So power of your test is one minus type two error. So that is where we apply type two error. Hmm? One minus beta. Suppose beta is twenty percentage, then the power of study is eighty percentage. Okay. So that also you keep in your mind. Ah, so we are done with all the MCQs from errors. Did you follow till here? Let me know, everyone. Smileys. Good to see smileys. Okay. Moving on to the most awaited bio statistics. Okay. So I, let me tell you. Of course, this is important, but what I'm going to teach you is not statistics. It is medical statistics or bio statistics, which you have already you used while you were doing your thesis so just think in terms of how you have conducted your thesis and in the same direction let's learn all the mcqs from biostatistics okay and this is very very important this is important for us doctors only for doing research as part of your PG thesis, you have done research. Me as a faculty, if I want a promotion, I have to do a research and I have to publish it in a good index range journal. Otherwise, I will not get uh, get promotion. So that is the MCI rule now. So we are all, every one of us, once you have become a doctor, once you have decided to take MBBS, you are left with no option but to do you know, research, medical research for your promotion and for your advancement. Okay, so... There is no life without medical research and without biostatistics. That is it. And it's very, very simple, actually. Because many, uh, let me tell you one thing. Most of the doctors think biostatistics as maths. Now, let me tell you, statistics is not maths. That has nothing to do with maths. These are just very simple concepts which have got beautiful application in our medical research. Or not in your, not only in research, in our medicine assets, that this has got an immense application. Okay, so uh, once you understand the concepts in biostatistics, you will start loving biostatistics. It will be your subject as much as it is mine. I'm also not good in math. I'm very bad in math. That's how I became. I chose to become a doctor because I can't do math. But when I when I started reading statistics as part of my once I started doing my PG when I started reading about statistics, then I realized that oh, this is not math. That is the first time I have realized it's not math. So I want you to. Take out that prejudice, that statistics maths. No, just sit with a, you know, uh, non-judgmental mind. Just relax, sit back and listen to these concepts in statistics, okay? So, let's see how you actually started your PG thesis. How many more slides? What happened? Vishwajit. See, guys, if you are in a hurry, you can very well leave, okay? I'm planning to take till uh, 8 only, but it may go up to 8, 5 or 8, 10, because the last topic is statistics. I'm done. Okay, that is the last topic. And this is the one which you are waiting for. So you can sit for some 15 more minutes. What is the time now? Just 7.45. Please continue. Thank you, Ankit, Sunil. Okay. So let's start with an example. Mm. Okay. Suppose I want to do a study to know the risk factors of diabetes mellitus or hypertension among patients coming to Ames, Delhi in the year 2021. I want to do a study to find out the risk factors of diabetes mellitus among patients coming to Ames, Delhi in the year 2021. See, ideally, I should be taking all the patients with diabetes who have come to Ames, Delhi in the year 2021. But you know, it's never ever possible, right? Because a huge number of patients will be coming with diabetes in any year to Ames, Delhi. So that is not practical or that is not feasible. 
So what I have done is for my study, I took a sample of 100 or 200 patients among from those diabetic patients who have attended the hospital or who have come to the hospital. In this context, I would like to introduce two terms which are not new to you. One is study population and next is study sample. Listen carefully. What is study population? All patients with diabetes who have come to AIMS Delhi in the year 2021 with diabetes is my big study population. And that small sample of say 100 or 200 patients which I have taken for my study is study sample. Okay. Are you with me till here? And, you know, all researchers all over the world do study by taking sample. And you have also done the same thing while doing the research, right? While doing your thesis, you were taking samples from the population. And even otherwise, we doctors know that take, studying sample alone is sufficient because we always take sample, right? Blood sample, urine sample, FNAC, hmm? biopsy, all these are taking samples. So we know that studying a sample alone is sufficient provided provided what it is a true representative of your population that is one thing that you have to ensure okay so studying a pop sample alone is sufficient provided it is a true representative it is a true it is a true representative of your population means what that means if your sample has got all the characteristics are there in the population you just need to study the sample alone so my next question is how do you ensure that your sample is a true representative of your population for that there is a scientific technique by which you have to take sample or you have to draw a sample from the population and that technique is known as naturally sampling technique Okay, so let's see what are the various sampling techniques. So first thing that you do is you take a sample. For that, you have to ensure the correct sampling technique. So let's learn about which are the sampling techniques. Sampling techniques are mainly divided into, so this is the technique by which you take samples from the population so that your sample will be a true representative of your population. Now, sampling techniques are mainly divided into two. One is random sampling. Second is, one is random, the second has to be non-random. Okay, so random and non-random. This is how they are broadly divided. Which among this is the best? That is the next MCQ. Random is the best. Okay, if possible, always, always go for random sampling. Hmm? Whereas non-random sampling is not that good. It has got a lot of bias. So best is random sampling. Okay, this is the best. I'm just writing the MCQ here. So let's see which are the random sampling techniques. There are mainly five random sampling techniques. Let's see the list. These names are important. Which among the following is a random sampling technique? Which among the following is a non-random sampling technique? So let's see the names first. Yeah, simple random, systematic random sampling, stratified random sampling, multi-stage random sampling, and cluster sampling. So remember these names under random sampling pattern. Just checking in between. Whenever I see a new chat, I'm just checking whether you have any doubt in the previous slide. Hmm. So no doubts so far. So these are the names coming under random sampling technique. Now let's start one by one. Simple random sample. As the name indicates. By the way, there's nothing to mark up hmm, in statistics. Not in statistics, nowhere you need to mark up anything. Just look at the name. That will tell you what actually is this technique is simple random sampling as the name indicates is the simplest method of taking sample from the population now which is the simplest method that is coming to your mind for example suppose there are 100 students in a class hmm? i want a sample of one it's the simplest method that is coming to your mind taking out lots right that is the simplest method that means you write all the names of these 100 students, put them in a basket, then just uh, just uh, shake it. And then after closing your eyes, pick one. This is simple random sample. Okay, 
that is lottery method taking out lot is known as lottery method so lottery method is the method by which you do simple random sampling and here the advantage or the mcq i would say is each and every participant has got equal and non chance for getting into the sample for example like i said here if i am taking one person from 100 what is the chance that each person will be included in the sample that is 1 by 100 right each and every person has got 1 by 100 probability of getting into the sample so it is known you know how much is your probability and it is equal for everyone in the group okay so this is simple random sampling first mcq is done by lottery method equal and non chance for each and every participant okay moving on to the second systematic random sampling as the name indicates Systematic sample, random sampling is not a systematic random sampling because you are taking sample in a systematic pattern. Okay, systematic pattern. For example, suppose I want a sample of say uh, 10 students from 100 using a systematic random sampling. Then I will say that every seventh person will be included into my sample. Okay, then I'll start counting from the first row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. First to seventh person will be the first person in my sample. Then I'll go on counting the same. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Next seventh person will be the second person. Likewise, I'll go on including every seventh person till I get 10 from this 100. This is systematic random sampling. That means every, here the MCQ is every nth person will be included in the sample. Okay, every nth person. Hope you are with me. That is systematic random sampling. Next is stratified. As the name indicates, stratified is known as stratified random sampling because here you are stratifying the population before taking the sample. By the way, what do you mean by strata? Strata means, you know, levels or groups. So as the name indicates here, you are first dividing your population into various strata. Then equal number is drawn from each strata. For example, suppose I want a, a sample of, again, let's let it be 10 from a from a group of students in class, which should include five boys and five girls. Okay, I want a sample of five boys and five girls from a class. So everybody is sitting together. So using stratified random sampling. So what I'll do first is I'll divide them into two strata, a straight of boys, a straight of girls. Then I'll randomly pick five boys from among the boys and five girls from among the girls. This is stratified random sampling like this. So that heterogeneous group is divided into homogeneous strata. Then equal number is drawn from each strata. So the stratification could be according to anything. Okay, so it could be according to some uh, some exposure. It could be according to their social strata. It could be according to anything, even according to religion people do. So all these are, these are coming under stratified random sampling. Okay, so that is the third one. Fourth is multi-stage random sampling. Again, as the name indicates, Multi-stage random sampling is not as multi-stage random sampling because you are doing this in multiple stages. Multiple means more than one stage. Okay. See, whenever, whenever you hear multi, a hi-fi setup comes to your mind, right? Multi-star or multiplex. Similarly, multi-stage random sampling is something that you do at a national or international level. For example, just listen to this example, you will understand it better. Suppose. I hope you are listening. Suppose government of India want to do a study to find out the nutritional status of school children. Okay, government of India want to do a study to find out the nutritional status of school children. That means they want random representation of school children from different parts of the country, right? So here they can use a multi-stage random sample. Now let's see how to do it. Listen, listen, listen. Here. Okay. See in the first stage, I hope you can see me. In the first stage, they'll write down the names of various states in India. Then they'll randomly pick a few states. In the second stage, they will write down the names of various districts in these selected states and they'll randomly pick a few districts. In the third stage, they'll write down the names of various schools in these selected districts. Then they will randomly pick a few schools. So the end product will contain random representation of school children from various parts of India. Right? I hope you are with me. So this is how you do. Like you see in this picture, this is how you do 
multi stage random sampling from multiple stages okay so you can start from the international level then you can come to the national level then you can come to the state level then you can come to the you know district level ward level that means from you know from hi fi you can come to the periphery so now the, here the mcq is successive sampling unit is from the previous sampling unit that means your second will be from the first your third will be from the second and your fourth will be from the third so likewise you are coming from high five to a low profile okay hope you are with me so this is multi stage random sampling and comes the last one cluster sampling again as the name indicates cluster sampling is known as cluster sampling because here you are studying natural clusters or groups in the population You're studying natural clusters or groups. Oh my God, it's gone again. Oh wait. Are you seeing it now? Please let me know. Are you seeing it now? Okay, okay, okay. This is the problem with the online class. Things may go wrong unexpectedly, as you can never uh, rely on gadgets. I don't. Okay, so cluster sampling, as the name indicates, you are studying when you are studying natural groups or clusters. Someone asked me yesterday from the uh, one one of the super special. I forgot. Oh no! I actually I remember your name. I'm not taking your name here. So. this is the answer to the question that you have asked huh? to study the natural groups or to study the population characteristic which is the sampling technique it is cluster sampling okay so when you are studying natural groups in the population by the way what do you mean by natural groups in the population i am telling you you take any population it consists of small 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 clusters like first you have a cluster of you know infants then you have a group of or cluster of uh toddlers then you have a cluster of preschool children school children antenatals elderly all these are clusters and if you want to study any of this population or group you can use cluster sampling for studying immunization coverage okay for studying immunization coverage your immunization coverage sometimes you are studying antenatals sometimes you are studying children okay 0 to 1 years so in immunization coverage studies the type of sampling that you do is cluster because there there you are taking you know various clusters on the population next thing you from cluster sampling is don't ask me what it is because it will go for days to explain what is the design effect just understand that a design effect is used in cluster sampling and cluster sampling is very easy to do okay out of all these that i have explained the easiest one to do is cluster sampling Okay, so for studying natural groups, a design effect is used there, and it is very easy to do. These are the MCQs that you can expect from cluster sampling. So we are done with all the random sampling technique. Moving on to non-random sampling. Let me tell you, non-random sampling is not that important. Random is the most important one for your exam. Non-random. Just let me introduce the names coming under non-random, so that if you are seeing it as an option, you'll be able to rule out. Ha ha. This is not. A, this is not a random sampling. The names are convenient sampling. The convenience means as per the convenience of the researcher. Then comes purposive sampling. You are doing it by purpose or on purpose. You are doing it again. There will be bias when you do something on purpose, right? Then quarter sampling, and the third, fourth is snowball sampling. Out of all this, I've seen question from snowball alone. So let's see what is snowball. Just one minute for snowball sampling. Others only names you need to remember. There is snowball sampling. Let's see what it is. Snowball sampling, first MCQ. This is done to study hidden population. Hidden population means difficult to access population. Hidden population, or you know, very rare or difficult to access population. When you are studying, you can do A C C E S. Right? There is a spelling. Difficult to access population. You do snowball sampling. For example, just try to listen to this example. You will understand it. Uh, just imagine that. I want to do a study to find out the prevalence of uh, STD among commercial sex workers. I repeat, I want to do a study to find out the risk factors of, or I want to study the prevalence of STD among CSW commercial sex workers. And you know, commercial sex workers CSWs are a hidden population. That means they are difficult to access population. So here, I will have to use snowball sampling. 
Now, let's see how to do this. See, somehow you try to get in touch with one CSW. And somehow you try to catch hold of one CSW. You collect data from her. Now, she will be knowing one or two or three others who are indulged in the same profession, right? So through her, you reach them. Data, collect data from them as well. Now, they may be knowing few others and they may in turn recruit few more. So likewise, you go on adding more and more and more till you get adequate number for your study. Okay, so this is how you do a snowball sampling. So this is your first CSW. Then she recruited two more. So you became two, three. From there, you got two more each. Huh? So that became four, five, six, seven. So, you know, it's like ripples. You know, you, you call, actually you call it as first wave, second wave, third wave. So likewise, you go on adding your waves till you get adequate number for your study. So this is snowball sampling. I hope you are with me. Okay. Uh, before that, um, uh, see, um, I have always been telling, as the name indicates, from the very beginning slide of biostatistics. So let me ask you, here also I'm say saying the same thing. As the name indicates, snowball sampling is not a snowball sampling because it's showing the property of a snowball. What is the property of a snowball? When it starts from the top of the mountain, it will be a very small, tiny ball, right? But as it rolls down the mountain, what happens? It, it accumulates, it collects more and more snow. And by the time it reaches the bottom, it will be a huge, big ball. That property we are making use to study hidden population. Okay, this is snowball sampling coming under non-random sampling method. So we are done with how to take sample. Moving on to the next part. After taking the sample, you have to analyze. That means you have to describe the sample, right? By the way, have you followed till here? Okay, Isha, Sunil, Himanshu. Okay. Okay. It's actually eight. Will you be sitting for some 15 more minutes? Maximum, I think, 15. It won't go beyond that. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So it's a big yes. So let me continue. Now let's see. After having taken the sample, next, what have you done for your research thesis is you describe the sample. And when you describe the sample, we describe in terms of two different entities known as Measure of central tendency and measure of dispersion. Okay, now let's see what is measure of central tendency. Measure of central tendency means, as the name indicates, it is a value which lies at the center of the data set. For example, imagine that I have taken, say, hemoglobin value of 20 people. Okay, I have the data set. This is the data set of or containing hemoglobin value of 20 people, starting from, say, some 10 up till 50. Okay, so these 20 values are somewhere, you know, somewhat dispersed like this. Mm -hmm. Imagine that there are 20. Mm -hmm. Now, one value will have a tendency to lie at the center, right? One particular value will be like almost, I'm not saying exactly, but almost at the center of its data set, right? This is known as measure of center tendency or in short, the value which lies at the center of your data set is your measure of center tendency. Or this is what you call as, or what a common man say as, on an average. Okay. Okay, this is on an average. This is what we say as average. This is nothing but your average. Okay. See, so the advantage is, if you want to convert the whole data set using one single number, or if you want to represent your whole data set using one single number, you can use measure of center tendency, which is nothing but on an average, because this is the value which is going to lie at the center. Moreover, this value is actually a reflection of all the other individual values in the data set. Okay. Now, when it comes to a layman, on an average is always arithmetic mean, right? Whereas for a doctor, or when it comes to our profession, we have three measures of center tendency, which are mean, median, and mode. So these are the three measures of center tendency. 
Now let's see one by one. What is the advantage of one over the other? Mean is arithmetic mean. I don't have to tell you what it is. You know, you add all the observation divided by the total number of observation from, I think, lower primary school, you have been learning this. Okay, so formula, you already know. Now, the problem with mean is, see, there is a problem for me. If there is an extreme value in the data set, mean has a tendency to get dragged towards the extreme value. Okay, that means if the extreme value is towards the higher side, the mean will get dragged towards the higher side. If the extreme value is towards the lesser side, the mean will get dragged towards the lesser side. So the problem is, if there is an extra extreme value in the data set, the mean is not going to represent your data set. Okay, and the problem is, for us doctors, mostly we will be we will be dealing with extreme values, right? We'll be having a lot of abnormal values. So mean is not going to represent your data set. So we have the next one, which is median. So if there is an extreme value in the data set, you can't use mean. That is not going to represent your data set. So go for the next. That is the advantage of median. Now, what is median? Middle value, right? Median means you know it. Middle value. So arrange the data set in the ascending order. Then the value you have at the center is median. And there is a formula to find out median. What is it? N plus 1 by 2. If n is the number of observation, then n plus 1 by 2 is the median. For example, if you have five values in the data, data set, then 5 plus 1, 6 by 2, 3. Ah, see, 3 is not the median. The value you have in the third position is the median. I hope the message is clear. 3 is not the median, but the value you have in the third position is the median. Okay, so that will tell you, this formula will tell you what is the position in which your median is lying. Then I have a question. What if n equal to 6? Then median would be 3.5, right? But the problem is you don't have any value in the 3.5 position. Then how will you find out mean? Anyone? Let me check. Sum of 3rd plus 4th upon 2. Exactly, exactly. See, 3.5 is lying between 3rd and 4th position, right? So you take the average of values you have in the third and fourth position. Okay, so these are the examples from median. And when do you use median? When you have an extreme value in the data set. When there is an extreme value, it is not going to get affected by the median, right? It will always lie at the center. Okay, so the point is, just look at the data set. If there is an extreme value given, go for median. Otherwise, you can use mean. And mode is not that important for your exam, but you know what mode is. Most frequently occurring value. Most frequently occurring value is mode. So these three are measures of center tendency, which is going to represent your data set as a single number. Okay. What is the answer for this? This was a previous MCQ. Median, median. Okay. Everybody is for median. That means I don't have to explain. And you are right. It is median only. Why? Because there is an extreme value 5000, which is nowhere near to the original values, original other values in the data set. So if you go for mean, the, the problem is mean will be mostly more than 1000, which is not going to represent your data set. So go for median. So the answer is median here. When do you use mode? What? When do we use mode then? See, mode is, mode is used when you have, you know, multiple, if something is very commonly occurring. But when it comes to our uh, medical profession, if you still remember how you have done your thesis, we never used mode at all. We were always using mean and median and standard deviation. Okay. So the point is, we don't use mode nowadays. But okay. please do understand that mode is also a measure of central tendency. Earlier, they were using mode, but not any more. And if you have, you know, for bimodal, these for uh, explaining diseases that have got bimodal occurrence, then we use mode. Okay, so because uh, a disease is most commonly seen during this age. Then you say, okay, mode is, this is the age in which you see this disease most frequently. So for those things, we use mode. But when it comes to calculations like this, we don't use, in medical, stat medical statistics, we don't use that much of mode. Hope I'm clear. Okay. Okay. 
going on to the second measure. First one is over measure of center tendency. Moving on to measure of dispersion. Center tendency means the value which lies at the center. Then what will be measure of dispersion? By the way, what do you mean by dispersion? Yeah, Anshul. Nothing? Okay. I thought uh, yeah. you asked me. There, I can't hear you. You're not audible, huh? So I can see you now, yeah. You're inaudible. Uh, so shall I continue? I'm unable to hear what you are trying to tell me. So I'm just continuing. Okay. Measures of dispersion. So what do you mean by dispersion? Dispersion means spread, right? Spread. So as the name indicates, this is a measure which will tell you about the spread of individual values around the central mean, which will tell you about the spread of individual values in your data set around your central mean. As a measure of dispersion, I'll just give you the names. Only the names are important. You have range, mean deviation, standard deviation, and interquartile range. How to call this? The one that is important for your exam is standard deviation. Okay. And standard deviation, the formula, I just show you the formula. This is the formula. I don't think formula is that much important. This square root of sigma x minus x dash the whole square divided by n. Just keep that in your mind and leave it. Now, the application of standard deviation is more important. What do you mean by standard deviation? It means, listen, listen, listen. Standard deviation means, on an average, how much is the dispersion of individual values in the data set around your central mean? That means, on an average, how much is the Spread on an average, how much is the spread of individual values in your data set around your central mean? That means if you're getting a small standard deviation, means what? All the individual values in the data set are clustered around your central mean. And if you're getting a large standard deviation, that means the individual values are far away from the central mean. This is how you interpret it. Okay. And standard deviation is used only in a normal distribution. Okay, standard deviation can only be used in a normal distribution. And that brings you to the next question, what is normal distribution? Okay, let's see what is normal distribution. This is very, very important. Huh? What is normal distribution? Unless you understand what is normal distribution, you won't understand what is skewed distribution. Okay, see, when I said normal distribution, definitely this curve might have come to your mind, right? You're Absolutely right. This is normal distribution. You have a peak and two tails like this. Now the question is, have you ever thought why your normal distribution curves always looks like this? To understand this, let's see one very simple example. Suppose I want to do a study to find out the height status of, say, males in city X. I want to do a study to find out the height status of males in city X. Ideally, I should be collecting data from each and every person, every male in city X, but you know, that's not possible. So what I have done is I took a sample of 1000 males and this is the result that I got. Okay, so here along the Y axis, I have the frequency and along the X axis, I have the values and this is what I got. Okay, so this is a histogram naturally. Now my question is, how are you going to interpret this? This means, just listen, majority of males are having a height between 167.5 to 177.5 centimeter, right? Those having height between 175 and 182.5 centimeter and 167 and 162.5 centimeter are less compared to this majority, right? And those males having height more than 182.5 and less than 160 are even more less, right? And those males having height more than 187 and less than 155 are rare, right? Naturally, this is how you will interpret this histogram or this data set, right? We have done that in your school time. Just test of significance. I'll come to it. 
actually test of significance if you are there in that uh, neat ss group i have given i have actually put uh, not me uh, dr rahul rajiv had actually put a youtube video of some 28 minutes i think regarding test of significance which was taken by me that is why i purposefully didn't touch that part because that will take at least half an hour to complete and in that video if you don't have it you can uh, you can reach me i'll uh, share you that in person okay that video so i won't be touching much into the test of significance just one test of significance we will uh, discuss when we are discussing kaplan mayer okay so by the way let me continue so this is how you are going to interpret the height from the histogram right next question next i want to know i want to can i draw a frequency curve from this can you remember the things that you have learned in school from a histogram how to find out a frequency curve first find out the midpoint at the top school days school days huh? your secondary school maths huh? find out the tip point tip at the top of midpoint at the top of your bar then you draw a curve passing through those points and this is your frequency curve right right you have done this so this is a frequency curve that i have made from the same histogram okay now what is the interpretation same is the interpretation majority of uh, males are having 167 to 177.5 i'm not going to those pages because it's the same data set i have not made any change in the data set only thing is that from the histogram i have made a frequency curve and interpretation is the same but now it looks like what this looks like a normal distribution curve like this right this is a normal distribution curve and this looks like a normal curve right so what do you mean by a normal distribution listen carefully please see not just height you take any variable in nature listen i repeat you take any variable in nature let it be height or weight or blood pressure or hemoglobin or cholesterol or sto or st but you take any variable in nature the nature itself has a tendency to keep everything within normal limits okay the values you have on the values you have outside the so called normal limits or normalcy will be always less in number the more you move away from the normal values less will be the number of people having those values right right see if i am taking see i can see that around 250 students are attending this class right now if i take your height or your weight or your blood pressure and plot a histogram or a frequency curve i'll be getting something like this huh with a peak at the center and two tails on both sides okay and the values which fall under the peak are the values which are coming within the normal range and the values which fall outside or the values which fall under the tail are the values which are abnormal or not normal are you with me okay so that is how you get a normal distribution curve so what i want to tell you is you plot any variable which is normally occurring in nature you will get a normal distribution curve with a peak at the center and two tails okay i think this does not require any explanation so this will clearly tell you what is normal distribution we are all coming assuming that ours is normal we are all expecting ours to be somewhere between this and this whereas einstein is very much outside huh? so this is normal abnormal distribution okay so this is this is how you plot a normal distribution so all values which fall under the peak will be considered normal okay now the next part see i told you if you know the measure of central tendency that means if you know mean and standard deviation you can explain your sample that is from where we started right how to explain the sample using mean and standard deviation for that you have you can use something known as three sigma rule sigma is nothing but that is a name for standard deviation okay the greek letter for standard deviation is sigma three sigma rule three sigma rule is what you see here if you know mean and if you know standard deviation mean the mean you have at the center okay i'm actually trying to draw a straight line which unfortunately has not become straight anyway 
if you have mean at the center and if you know standard deviation, then mean plus one standard deviation minus one standard deviation will include 68 percentage of values in the data set. If you go for two standard deviation, that means mean plus two standard deviation minus two standard deviation, that will include 95 percentage of values in your data set. And if you go for three standard deviation plus three minus three, that will include 99.7 percentage of values in your data set. Okay, this is three sigma rule. Now let's see how to apply three sigma rule when you are when you are describing your own sample. Now let's see the example uh, that we have dealt for explaining this particular uh, concept. See, this is actually a uh, uh, data set that one of my PGs have collected. See, from that, mean height was found to be 172.5 and standard deviation was found to be five centimeter. Okay, now let's see how to apply three sigma rule. Listen carefully, please. If you go for one standard deviation, plus one standard deviation, minus two standard deviation, it will include 60 percentage of values in this data set. That means, listen, listen carefully. 60 percentage of people in this sample or 68 percentage of males in this sample are having a height which ranges between 167.5 and 177.5. If you go for two standard deviations, that means plus 10 minus 10, that will include 95 percentage of values in the data set. That means 95 percentage of males in the sample are having a height which ranges between 162.5 centimeter and 182.5 centimeter. And if you go for three standard deviation, that will include 99 percentage of values in its data set and the values will change accordingly. I hope you are with me. Okay, so this is how you explain your sample using your mean and standard deviation of measure of center tendency and measure of dispersion. Have you followed till here? Okay. Okay, Isha, Kamini, Suprabha. Okay, okay. Someone is asking, what is a bell curve, standard normal curve? Just one slide on that. See, if you have a if you have a peak at the center and two tails, you call it as normal curve. Okay, so the normal curve can be drawn either like this or like this or like this. All these are normal only, but we have only one standard normal curve. So standard means it is used for reference. Okay, it is used for reference. And the standard normal curve have some features which are this is what you said, bilaterally symmetrical bell-shaped curve, perfectly bell-shaped curve. That means if you cut it at the center, one side will be exact mirror image of the other side. Second point, from standard normal curve. See, it's not normal curve, but standard normal curve. All these measures of center density, mean, median, mode, will lie in the center, and that will divide your data set into two halves. Okay, that means equal number of values less than mean on one side and equal number of values more than mean on the other side. So, the value of mean, median, mode will be equal to zero. That is the next MCQ. Third is standard deviation will be equal to one. It is fixed as one for our comparison purpose. And the area under the curve is also one. These are the MCQs from standard normal curve. Okay, next. I hope you're with me. Hmm? I think only five, six more slides. Hmm? So skewing is coming after this. Standard error. See, I'm not going to tell you what is standard error. Just understand that standard, just like you have standard deviation for sample, you have standard error for the whole population. Since we don't have time, I'm not going into those details. Just understand that it is the dispersion of the individual values in the population around the population mean. Nothing beyond that. Okay. And there is a formula for calculating standard error from the standard deviation. So you have a sample. From the sample, you have a standard 
you have a mean and standard deviation, right? And from the standard deviation, you can find out standard error using the formula standard error equal to standard deviation divided by square root of this is sample size. This formula is important. How to find out standard error? Standard deviation divided by square root of sample size will give you standard error. Okay. Now the question is, what is the use of standard error? What is the application of knowing standard error? See, though you are studying a sample, your original intention is to know what is happening in the sample. It's not to know what is happening in the sample, but to know what is happening in the population, right? See, though, though I have studied uh, height of 100 males, my original, the objective or my original intention is not to know the high status of these 1,000 males, but to know the high status of all males in city X. Right. And finally, my interpretation should be for city X because I started off by first, my original intention was to know what is happening in the population, right? So, to know the status in the population, you can make use of standard error. Okay, now I'll show you, I'll tell you how to do it. See, you have taken a sample. From the sample, you have got mean and standard deviation. Then standard deviation divided by square root of sample size will give you standard error. Now let's see how the standard error will help you to predict the values in the population. For example, mean, I got mean height from the sample. Now I'm going to predict the average height of all males in CTX using standard error. Now, one more thing. Since I am predicting the values, I am just predicting the values in the population, it is never possible to pinpoint the exact value, exact mean, like I have done in sample, because you are just predicting. So, since you are predicting, you cannot pinpoint the exact value. What you can do to the maximum is you can fix a range within which the values in the population would be like. And that range is given by the formula see from the sample you got mean right then actually i'm thinking whether to go into those details but i have decided not to go into much of the details so i'm just giving you the formula because we are running out of time your sample mean plus two standard error minus two standard error is the range within which the values in the original values in the population or normal values in the population would be like. Okay. And this range is given a beautiful name which someone had mentioned while I was just going through the chat. 95 percentage confidence interval. Something went wrong. It is confidence interval only. Okay. Confidence interval. 95 percentage confidence interval. Okay. I'm sorry. Confidence. Interval. 95% confidence interval. And what is 95% confidence interval? It is given by the formula your sample mean plus or minus 2 standard error. And what is it? This is the range within which the normal values in the population would be like. Okay, range within which the normal values in the population would be like. In the population, that is how you are predicting the values in the population using your mean and standard error, okay, like this. So this is your 95 percentage confidence interval. That means, see, the one more thing, the value that you get as minus two standard error is known as lower limit of confidence, and the value that you get as plus two standard error is known as upper limit of confidence, okay. This was also a previous MCQ. Actually, 95 percentage confidence interval was a previous MCQ. And the options were mean plus or minus two standard deviation, mean plus or minus two standard error. So always, always remember it is standard error and not standard deviation, which is going to predict the values in the, for, in the uh, population. So for 95 percentage confidence interval, it is always mean plus or minus two standard error and not standard deviation. Okay. That means 95 percentage of values will be lying between, in the population, would be lying between your lower limit and upper limit. That means, listen, 5 percentage of values are outside this 95 percentage confidence interval, right? Out of that, 2.5 percentage of values will be less than your lower limit and 2.5 percentage of values will be more than your upper limit. Okay, so we have, we are almost completely done with all the important things in your medical research through which we have learned a lot of things in biostatistics. So we started off with sample, right? 
So I have told you how to take a sample, what are the sampling methods. Then after taking the sample, next you want to explain it using your mean and standard deviation of measure of central tendency and measure of dispersion. And once you have described the sample, next part is to see what is happening in the population. For that, you have to find out standard error and then you can explain using 95 percentage confidence interval. Okay, hope you are with me. One more thing, shall I ask you? Okay, just one more. I, I don't feel like leaving that. You know, what is the, uh, can someone tell me what is the application of 95 percentage confidence interval, interval in our medical field? You know, we apply 95 percentage confidence interval for finding all the normal values in our medical field. For fixing normal values, I would say fixing normal values in our medical field, we always use 95 percentage confidence interval. If you can recollect all the values we have in our medical field, at least think about the values we have in the lab form. All values are falling within a range, right? SGOT, hmm? you have a range. SGPT, you have a range. Then cholesterol, you have a range. Why? Because all these normal values we have found using. 95 percentage confidence interval hemoglobin we say 12 to 14 okay so all these are coming within a range because these values are fixed using 95 percentage confidence interval hmm? that is why everything is falling within a range because we, we have no other option okay can you answer according to the empirical rule what percentage of data should lie within a normal limit are you guys there or gone kaplan mayor next is kaplan mayor this is done 95 percentage. Okay. I think you might be feeling hungry because I started feeling hungry. I was planning to stop before 8, but you know, it extended a little bit. Coming to the last part, skewed distribution. After that, I have one slide on Kaplan Mayer. So please sit back. Skewed is the last part, and one more that is Kaplan Mayer that contains just one slide. Skewed distribution. Now, what is Q distribution? This was also an MCQ two years back. So, Q distribution is also known as asymmetrical distribution. Asymmetrical distribution. See, normal, till now we were talking about normal distribution, right? You get normal distribution when you're studying normal people. And you get asymmetrical or abnormal distribution when you're studying naturally abnormal people. By the way, who are abnormal people to us? Patients. Okay. When you are dealing with patients' values, sometimes you will be getting skewed distribution. Second difference. In a normal distribution, the shape was you have the P, you had the peak at the center and two tails on both sides. Right? Whereas in abnormal distribution, you will not find this picture. Instead, you will have you will be having peak towards one side and tail towards the other side. Sometimes like this, sometimes like this. Okay, third difference. <coughs> In a normal distribution, I said mean, median, and mode. All the measure of center tendency will lie at the center. Mean equal to median equal to mode, right? Whereas in a skewed distribution, mean, median, mode will take three different positions. Okay, so these are the basic differences between skewed distribution and normal distribution. Okay, one more point. See, we know that we have two types of skewed distribution. One is positive, also known as right-sided skewing. Right-sided skewing. The next is, one is positive, second has to be naturally negative or left-sided skewing. Don't forget, positive is Right, negative is left, left-sided skewing. Because I have seen questions in which you are given image and you have to find out whether it is positive or negative. So what I'm going to say next is very important. See, uh, whether to call it as positive or negative is determined by the position of peak or tail. Any idea? It is determined by the position of the tail. Just look at the tail. If tail, very good, very good. 
I, I, that is, I don't have to teach you anything at all. You already knew everything. Good. Just look at the tail. If tail is towards the right, it is right-sided skewing. If tail is towards the left, then it is known as left-sided skewing. Okay. Now, let's see how to find out the skewing. Right side is skewing. See, till now, we were talking about the hemoglobin value of normal people. Now, just imagine that I'm taking a sample of hemoglobin values from patients admitted in oncology ward. Okay, or patients with malignancy. Now, what will be, what is your impression about the hemoglobin value of patients with malignancy? Majority will be anemic, right? So, if I, listen, I'm taking a sample of hemoglobin values of patients with malignancy. So, majority will be anemic. So, if I plot a frequency curve with values along the x-axis and frequency along the y-axis, my question is, where do you expect majority of values to be falling? Towards the lesser side of hemoglobin or towards the higher side of hemoglobin? Towards the lesser side of hemoglobin, like this, right? Very good, very good. So you will all agree with me. You will be getting something like this. See, majority are having hemoglobin between, I would say, some 4 to 10. That means majority are anemic. Okay. And we have few extreme values towards the right side. Mm -hmm. Few might be having polycythemia or something like that. Okay. So majority will be following or will be falling towards the lesser side of hemoglobin. Now let's see what about the position of mean, median and more. This is already arranged in the ascending order. And median is the value that you have in the middle. Right? Median will be here. What about mode? Mode will be always. What is mode? Most frequently occurring value. So that has to be the top of your peak. This is your mode. No doubt about it. Now what about mean? We have already seen that mean has got a problem. What is that problem? If there is an extreme value, the mean will get dragged towards that extreme value. Right? Here the extreme values are towards the, the majority are falling within the lesser side of hemoglobin, whereas we have few extreme values towards the higher side of hemoglobin. So, mean will go along with them. So, mean will get dragged towards the higher values. Okay, so that will take somewhere here. Now, look at this and tell me what is the position of mean, median and mode in a right side of screen. That is the next thing. Mean, more than median, more than mode. Right? Very, very, very important. This also was a question I have seen. This question. When you have messaged me this question. Okay. Next. Let's see. Left side is QA. This time I'm going to take uh, BMI values of PCOD patients. Okay. So, what is your expectation about BMI value of PCOD patients? Majority will be obese, right? So, if I take a sample of BMI of patients with PCOD and if I plot a frequency curve with Values along the x-axis and frequency along the y-axis, where do you expect the majority of values of BMI to be falling? Towards the higher side of BMI or lesser side of BMI? Towards the higher side of BMI like this. Right? Okay. So, you'll be having, this is obviously a left-sided skewing, right? Because you have teeth towards the right and tail towards the left. Obviously, this is left-sided only. Now, let's see what about the position of mean, median and mode here. This is already arranged in the ascending order, right? And median has to be the value which falls at the center. So median will be in the center only. What about mode? Most frequently occurring value is always at the top. So mode will be somewhere here. What about mean? Again, here the extreme values are towards the lesser side because majority are having higher BMI and we have one or two or three, a few number of lean PCOD patients. So extreme values are towards the lesser side of BMI and mean will get dragged towards the lesser side. So it will be Somewhere here. Now look at this and tell me what is the position of mean, median, and mode in the left side of screen. Will be mean less than median, less than mode. Right? Oh. So these are the things that you have to keep in your mind while explaining skewness. So you can expect a picture-based question, and you will also be given values, and you have to find out whether it is left side is skewing or right side side is queuing, like this. Okay, this is a histogram. What I said and done. Finally, at first, you are making a histogram. Okay, this is the question that I wanted to tell you. For a given set of values, mean equal to 20, median 24, more 26, given distribution is. What is your answer? Quick.
Correct. It is left sided. No doubt. May I know why? Because mean less than, median less than, no doubt. It is right sided. Another question. State whether the data reflecting the heights of individuals in the general population are likely to be skewed to the right, skewed to the left, or symmetrical. Logic. Just use your common sense. When you plot the age of death, you're plotting age of death, okay, in a population. Will it be right or left or, okay, okay. Getting a lot of answers. Or you are symmetrical. Wait, what is the question? Oh, what I am seeing here is a different question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is actually general population. Sorry. This is symmetrical only, okay. What I have seen here is a different question. This one. This is symmetrical, okay. This is the question that I was asking. Age of death in a general population. What type of skewing is it? Right. Correct. It is left because the peak will be towards the higher end of fields, right? And the tail will be towards the left. So it is left. So that covers our skewing as well. Coming to the last slide or last topic, topic Kepler Mayer. Many are interested to know what is Kepler Mayer. So will you sit back for five more minutes? I I will not go into the details of Kepler Mayer. Just to, I'll show you how to read Kepler Mayer. By the way, what is Kepler Mayer survival curve? See, it is a curve or it is something. It's a, I would say, it's a graph that we draw for survival analysis. Survival analysis means you are taking a group of patients who are put on one particular treatment and you are following them into the future and you are measuring their survival at the end of say some five years or two years okay and here what you do is you are actually calculating the survival rate at every post point one patient dies hmm? that means suppose you are starting with the with a hundred patients who are put on one particular treatment hmm? a group of patients having one particular disease and who are started on one particular treatment you are following them to see the survival rate. Okay, and you're calculating survival rate at every point a patient dies. Okay, and then at the end, you are adding up all these survival dates, rates at different point, and at the end, you are seeing that, okay, talk the survival rate of patient, five year survival rate is this much, two year survival rate is this much, three year survival rate is this much. After adding, or you are taking the cumulative survival rate from each point. Okay, so I'm not going into those details, just understand this is how you do the survival analysis. So here the most important thing is, time to event is very important. That means the time in which the event takes place is very important because every time one patient dies, you are calculating survival rate. And since time to event is very important, this is used for those diseases where survival is very less or for those diseases where death is happening very fast as in the case of malignancy okay so we usually use i'm not saying usually most commonly we use kepler mayer curve in you know own code treatment okay in others also we use but i'm telling you most commonly it is used in uh, those patients where you know death is happening very fast so in malignancy and in many other diseases where death is happening very fast or the outcome is happening very fast you use survival analysis and Kepler Mayer curve. Now, you would be wondering why it is known as Kepler Mayer curve because this was actually done by two people. One person is Kepler and the other is Mayer. These two scientists, they together made the survival curve. And that is the only reason why it is known as Kepler Mayer curve. Because this was proposed by Mr. Kepler and Mr. Mayer. Okay. Now, actually, I was planning to explain what is Kepler Mayer, how to calculate Kepler Mayer, but now I am feeling that it is not worth to go through all those uh, details, but 
I'll just show you the slides. Hmm? This is how you calculate Kaplan, uh, how you construct Kaplan Mayer. Whenever one patient dies, you are calculating the survival rate and finally you are taking the cumulative survival rate. So those are not important. And this is how you make a survival curve. Now let's see the application and how to read it. The application comes, as I told you, when you are comparing two different modalities of treatment or when you are comparing two different treatments. For example, let's see how to read this. Here you are comparing a new drug. Let this red be a new drug and blue be an old drug. Okay, let it be a chemotherapy. This is a new chemotherapy and you have an old chemotherapy. So those both patients were started together. Hmm? Old chemo. Now, which one do you think has got a better prognosis or better survival rate? Even without me telling anything, you will be able to tell me by looking at this. Old or new? Which one is better? Definitely it is new. Come on. Yeah, correct. Come on, you're right. It is new only. New chemo. Because... See, when you followed them, when I reached, uh, say, 50 days, 50 days, when I looked at the 50 day survival rate for the new chemotherapy, it is see, around 85 percentage, or I would say around 90 percentage survival rate was there at the, at the end of 50th day. Whereas for the old one, see how much is the survival rate? It's around, I would say, 60 percentage, only 60 percentage here. Whereas at the end of 50th day, there was around 90% survival rate in old one. Now look at 125th day. Okay, 125th day. This is the 125th day. How many survived in the new chemotherapy? I would say around 50% survived. Whereas in the old one, only 25% survived at the end of 125th day. So this is how you read get plan made. Here, each dip is happening. Should I say? Yeah. Anyway, each dip is happening when one patient is dying. Okay, because you are calculating the survival rate at every point one patient dies, then you are taking its cumulative effect and that is how you are doing this. Okay. Now, the outcome measure in Kaplan Mayer or outcome measure that you calculate in a survival analysis is same as that of relative risk. But since you are taking See, this is a prospective study, right? You have a group of patients on a particular treatment, another on a different type of treatment. You are following them to see the percentage curing, okay, or in RCT or in uh, cohort. Both these are actually prospective study designs only. So in both, you can always calculate relative risk. That means incidence of disease among the treatment group and incidence of disease among the, or outcome among the control group, right? So what you calculate is somewhat similar to relative risk only, but since you are calculating something negative like death or side effect or complication, you call it as hazard ratio. So hazard ratio is nothing but the relative risk. Relative risk that you get in a survival analysis only because you are calculating something negative. So we call it as hazard ratio. The same as your risk ratio or relative risk. That means incidence among the exposed divided by incidence among the non-exposed. Then you have something known as log rank test. This is the test of significance. Test of significance that you use is a non-parametric test of significance that you use to compare a survival analysis. What is test of significance? What are parametric? What are non-parametric? All those I have given in that YouTube link, which I have posted in your group. And those who are not there in that group, you can either join the group or you can directly contact me. Okay, I'll give you my mail ID later at the end. So this is a non-parametric test of significance. So I'm not going into the details of what is a test of significance parametric. Okay, and the last is box proportional hazard test. This is a regression technique that you use in survival analysis or Kaplan Mayer method. You don't need to know what is regression, but just do understand this name because this name was a previous MCQ. What is Cox proportional hazard test? This is a regression test that you do in 
survival analysis or Kaplan Mayer. So when it comes to survival analysis or Kaplan Mayer, these three terms you have to keep in your mind. One is hazard ratio, which is nothing but incidence among the exposed divided by incidence among the non-exposed or incidence among your treatment group divided by incidence among the old group, new drug versus old drug outcome. Logram test is the test of significance and Fox proportional hazard test is the regression test that you use. Okay. That's all about our today's session. Thank you very much, guys, for your patient listening. I hope you have followed till here. Have you understood till here? Okay. I hope this was uh, really, this at least helped you a little bit. And these were actually based on previous MCQs and the inputs that I got from various SS participants. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so what I want to tell you at this point is you're going to write the exam in a few days. So stay positive always. Never lose your possibility because positivity, because always, always positivity wins. And if you have a dream, I know it's your dream to get your desired PG seat, I mean SS seat. And as Paulo Coelho said, when you want something very, very badly, all the universe will conspire you in helping to achieve it, right? So stay positive. You will definitely reach your dream. And I hope that this dress, this, this one has actually, this session has actually helped you. And if you have any further doubts, you can contact me. I'll give you my contact ID. I think I have my, yeah, this is my mail ID. D-R-R-A-J-A-S-I at yahoo.com. This is my official ID, Dr. Regisi at yahoo.com. And there is a Telegram group. If you are interested, you can join the Telegram group. So, uh, was it useful? Please let me know whether it was useful. Oh, thank you. 200 percentage. Okay, no need to study again. Okay, that is something which is really, really making me excited because you said you don't have to read further. Okay, mail ID I have given Nias, which this is my mail ID, drrajasi at yahoo.com. Thank you, Ankit. Yes. So uh, if we don't have anything further to discuss, Indian should treat analysis. You want me to explain once again? Yeah, okay, do that, Bhuvaneshwari. By mean or lesser side in negative skewing. Because in negative skewing, See, in negative skewing, I said the extreme values will be towards the lesser side, right? And mean will, see, I haven't, see, we have learned, even otherwise using our logic, we know that whenever there is an extreme value in the data set, when you take average, by the way, what does mean? You add all the observation divided by your total number of observation, right? It is your arithmetic mean. So when you take mean, the mean will, whenever there is an extreme value, if the extreme value is towards the higher side, the mean will get dragged towards the extreme uh, side, towards the higher side. And if the if the extreme value is towards the lesser side, the mean will get dragged towards the lesser side. Okay. And in negative skewing, do you remember the example? It was PCOD of patients, PCOD and BMI. So majority of patients or BM, BMI of PCOD patients were towards the higher side, whereas extreme values were towards the lesser side. That is why mean got dragged towards the lesser side. Okay. No, no. Extreme. Okay, okay. I think you got confused with what is extreme value. See, extreme value means the value which are lying outside the majority. Majority are towards the higher side, right? And extreme values means 
not those values the values which are not coming along with the majority majority will be towards the higher side whereas extreme values to, will be towards the lesser side that is for tendency death in population how was the answer left sided come on mm -hmm. wait you won't let me go but it's fine see i if i plot age and frequency of death people are dying at as the age increases or decreases as the age increases right so you know it will be almost zero here but as the age passes what happens the number of deaths will go on increasing like this and after 60 70 80 will go on like this that means it is peaking the tail is towards the left side and the peak is towards the right side okay okay so shall we stop then you can ask me you can uh, you can contact me through your through my mail id okay so i think it has exceeded time so yeah good night thank you very much i think this will be available in youtube i'll ask uh, the id people to upload this in youtube for a few days so you will be able to go through it once again okay so those who have said have uh, uh, missed the initial part you can watch it once again okay bye guys good night so all the best stay positive and take care